Back in the 1970s, my uncle used to spend a couple of weeks in his hunting cabin that was in the middle of nowhere up in Canada. Most of the time his trips were very relaxing and enjoyable. He would head back home afterwards feeling refreshed, having unplugged from society for a bit. He used to tell me that he had some of the best moments of his life sitting on his front step, watching as the stars faded from the sky and the dawn appear on the horizon. He was a real man of the earth, who enjoyed being one with nature. I'm surprised he never sold his condo and went full Amish. There was one year that nearly derailed his loner lifestyle and scared him so much, he nearly sold the cabin and never went back. It's the most popular story circulated through my extended family, and the reason I always triple check my locks before going to bed. Now for some context, the cabin wasn't accessible by vehicle, and there was a small amount of hiking involved to reach it. It was about 400 square feet and was made up of a single room. There was no running water and no electricity. It was a wooden structure built upon a small stone foundation, and because of this, there was about a 12 inch space between the ground and the floor of the cabin. There was a trapdoor by the fireplace where he would drop extra logs of firewood, so he wouldn't have to venture outside to collect more. The incident happened in October. It was extremely cold even by Canada standards. When he wasn't at the cabin, he had the front door locked with a padlock. But upon entering, the first thing he noticed was the hint of tobacco in the air. This confused him, because he didn't smoke, and he hadn't been in the cabin since January. But he shrugged it off and got himself settled in. His first order of business was to get a fire going. He lit the lanterns, unpacked, pulled up his chair to the fire, and fell asleep. He woke up several times during the night, always in the state of panic, as if the chair was tipping over and he was falling. But the wind was roaring so hard outside, and the cabin walls were creaking so much, he shrugged it off as paranoia. He eventually left his chair and got into bed. He awoke one more time that night. When dawn was just beginning to peek through the window, he shot up in bed when he heard a loud roar of the wind, and through his haze of sleep, he thought he saw a figure outside the window. He scrambled out of bed, knocking over his chair, grabbed his hunting rifle and bolted across the room and flung open the front door. Fresh snow had fallen during the night, but there weren't any signs of footprints outside. He slammed his door shut, put down his rifle and muttered a few profanities as he righted his chair. He opened the trap door, grabbed a few more logs and put them on the fire, and then went back to bed. It should be noted that the lantern was burning low when he woke up, as was the fire, so there wasn't much light in the room. At about 9am, my uncle woke up to the sun shining brightly through the cabin windows. He got up, warmed some water for coffee by setting the kettle down on the shelf over the fire and then opened the front door. He said what he saw next nearly gave him a heart attack. There were footprints in the snow leading away from the cabin's front door. My uncle, being his normal impulsive self, threw on some clothes and boots, grabbed his rifle, and followed the footprints through the trees with his gun up, ready for confrontation. The footprints circled up the surrounding hills, and my uncle followed them to a spot where the entrance of the cabin was in plain sight. The intruder had clearly crouched for a long while, and the tracks made off at a good stride further into the woods. Based on the boot size of the footprints, the stranger was just as large as my strapping 6 foot 3 uncle, if not larger, and was clearly expecting my uncle to notice his tracks and come after him, or else he wouldn't have stopped to watch the cabin. He would have continued to run and make his escape. My uncle didn't want to fall into any kind of trap, so he fired a single shot into the air as a warning, and made his way back to the cabin. Once inside, he locked the door and opened the trap door by the fireplace. As he poked his head down, he scanned the area under the cabin with a flashlight and discovered one of his own blankets in a dirty tangled mess in the corner. There were a couple of empty soup cans he recognized from his own pantry, a single spoon, and several dozen small bones, most likely squirrels or rabbits. What my uncle thinks occurred was that somehow an intruder had broken into the cabin while my uncle was away and had been hiding under the floor the entire time he had been there the previous day. He came to the conclusion that the reason he kept being jolted awake the night before was because half of the chair had been resting on top of the trap door and whoever was below was trying to escape by lifting the hatch. Later on, when my uncle thought he saw a figure outside the window, 
He later realized that the figure had actually been inside and was heading for the door, but was interrupted and the man had likely leapt back down through the trap door when my uncle sprang to life and noisily knocked over his chair. The creepiest thing about all of this wasn't the fact that a complete stranger was hiding so close when my uncle thought he was alone. It was the fact he was hiding in the first place that really calls into question who he was and what his motives were. It was never confirmed how the man broke into the cabin, but was already under the floor when my uncle arrived, which tells me he was going to great lengths to make sure that he wasn't discovered. When he finally emerged from under the floor, he could have killed my uncle in his sleep, but he took the opportunity to run. It's possible that he simply decided that he didn't want to risk a struggle, but I think whoever he is, he was on the run, or at the very least, had something to hide. Earlier the same year in May, not very far away, a 17-year-old girl had gone missing while walking up the road to visit her cousins, and shortly after in August, a 21-year-old woman was found stabbed to death on the very same road the girl had disappeared on. I believe whoever was in my uncle's cabin could very well have had something to do with one or both of these unsolved crimes. My uncle never reported the incident to the police, and to the best of his knowledge, the intruder never returned. But it makes me wonder to this day, are we ever really alone when we think we are? Because if someone could be hiding under the floor in an isolated cabin during the winter, is it really impossible that there could be someone under your bed right now? Back in the early 2000s, I had just graduated from high school and was spending the first few days of summer camping out in the woods on my grandfather's property in Maine. I was with my two best friends, Heather and Kim, all of us being big outdoor enthusiasts who enjoy climbing up trees and lying out under the stars at night. On the second day of our camping trip, we decided to take our tent deeper into the woods so we wouldn't be able to see my grandfather's house anymore. We liked the idea of feeling alone and independent. After we set up the tent, we started a game of Capture the Flag, where we each had a different colored towel that we got to hide in plain sight, either up a tree or in a hole somewhere, and then we would search for our opponent's towel and try to get it back to home base, which was the tent. I wasn't very good at winning this game, and I was determined to go the extra mile this time. The rules were that the flag had to be visible enough so the color stood out at a short distance, but I was going to bend the rules a bit and hide the flag in a small cave I knew was nearby. Both girls were unlikely to venture too far into this cave to look. I had been to this cave several times and referred to it as Tiger Lily's Cave, you know, like the character from Peter Pan. It was small and narrow, and you had to crouch to walk in but I didn't mind risking the cobwebs in my hair. I went as far back into the cave as I could and dropped the bright green towel on the ground. Visible enough if you walked deep enough into the cave, you would find it. When I noticed something, just beyond the edge of the daylight, streaming through the entrance, I saw a glittering against the sun. I figured that it was a coin or something. I moved in to take a closer look. I discovered that it was a buckle on a strap of a man's suspenders. The end with the buckle was lying on the leaves, as motionless as a dead snake. The other end of the suspender was attached to the pants of a man's body, lying face down in the ground. His head was wrapped up tightly in a plastic bag. I shrieked and ran back outside the cave and kept screaming for my friends until they came running. I told them I found a body with a plastic bag over his head and all three of us immediately went back into the cave. And in the semi-darkness, we all started speaking very fast and very loud, arguing whether it was real, and how could it have gotten there. It was Heather who pointed out that this was a victim of murder, and we had to get out of there, as the murderer could return. We ran back out of the cave as fast as we could, while crouched over, and then sprinted back to my grandfather's house, who, go figure, wasn't even home. I called my mom from the kitchen phone, and she told us to call the police. By the time my mom, my grandfather, and the two policemen had all arrived, 40 minutes had gone by. We led them with much more confidence and excitement than fear back to Tiger Lily's cave, where I immediately noticed that the leaves had been disturbed. One of the policemen crouched down, 
and wandered in with a flashlight, and after a few minutes called out to our group that there was no body, but plenty of dried blood, and clear evidence that something heavy had been dragged out. He emerged from the cave holding my bright green towel. There was a few smears of blood showing against the fabric. We immediately were sent back home. In the next 12 hours or so, were a circus of people walking back and forth in and out of the woods. About a dozen more cops arrived with dogs to track whoever removed the corpse. I remember us all grilling out on the back deck and watching the cops walking in and out of the woods. A few of them even ate with us and filled us in on a few details. By the next day, most of them were gone. One police car was stationed on the street by my grandfather's driveway to keep an eye on things. But no reporters ever came to interview us, and we never heard anything about it on the news. I gave the best description of the body that I could, but given that it was dark and there was a bag over the man's head, the best I could do was describe the suspenders and shirt. After another week or so, the police released the scene, and we never heard from them again. We never found out what happened to the body or who dragged it away. My grandfather has since died, but his property was sold to a family I know very well, and since then I have taken my kids to the cave for them to explore. It's one of the most exciting and mysterious childhood memories of mine. Finding a body in a spooky cave in the Maine wilderness. That's the stuff Stephen King novels are built on. When I was 17, I had the extreme misfortune of breaking both of my legs at the same time. I had been playing football with some of my friends out behind my house in a wide open field. There was a barn that had been abandoned and was slowly rotting away. The way the barn was built, it was nestled right onto the side of the hill. So you could walk around the far end of the barn, climb up the hill, and walk onto the roof. I was being a bit of a dick during the game and I deliberately ran through what we had marked as out of bounds and ran up the hill and across the barn roof, intending to leap down off of it and score a bogus touchdown. But due to the rain, the wooden roof beams were wet and soggy, and when the wood gave out under my feet, I crashed downwards through the ceiling and landed hard on some old farming instruments, including buckets, a set of horseshoes, and a spare tire for an old tractor. I'm actually pretty lucky that I didn't get impaled by a pitchfork or anything. To make a long story short, I broke both of my legs, dislocated my left arm, and had a concussion. I was rushed to the hospital and was discharged in a wheelchair, where I was forced to stay on the ground floor of my house. One night my parents and sister decided that they wanted to go see the new Lord of the Rings movie that was playing, and kind of without warning they said they were leaving. I found myself in the house alone. At first, I didn't mind. I had complete control of the TV and could play my video games as loud as I wanted to. But before long, I got frustrated. Most of my games were upstairs where I couldn't get them and couldn't reach the microwave or most of the higher cabinets from my wheelchair. So I was very limited on what I could do and I began to feel very bitter. I rolled myself into the dining room without turning on the lights and peeked out into the backyard, out across the field and into the barn. I'm not sure why I wanted to look back there. It was dark out, and there wasn't much to see. But I'm the type of guy who always has to be aware of his surroundings, in order for my mind to be at peace. I looked out at the stars for a few moments, and was about to roll myself backwards, and return to the kitchen, when I saw something. By the light of the moon, I saw two figures walk out of the barn, and make their way towards my house. I froze, too nervous to even let the curtain fall back in place. I made myself stare back towards the approaching figures. They weren't just walking, they were holding hands. I remember speaking out loud, are those kids? I felt most of the fear melt away and was replaced by rage. Who were these brats trespassing on our property at nine o'clock at night? We lived in a pretty secluded area and it would have taken quite a lot of walking through the woods in the dark to enter our backyard from that direction. That's when I made my first mistake. I opened the window and called out to them. Hey, what are you doing? Both figures immediately stopped in their tracks, still holding hands, but otherwise keeping completely still. Get out of our yard, I called out. There was perhaps five seconds of silence before one of them called out in a voice so calm it made all the terror and fear come rushing back. Can we come in? The voice sounded muffled 
and at this point, my eyes had adjusted to the darkness. Now that I had a better look at them, I could tell that they weren't kids. I would say that they were probably teenagers, wearing white porcelain masks that had these sadistic painted smiles on them. My response died in my throat, and my hands began to shake. I slammed the window shut and wheeled myself fast back across the dining room and into the living room. I shut off the TV and lights, casting the house into darkness, and rolled into the den. I got out of my wheelchair and crawled across the floor to the window and peeked out. They were both at the same spot, still holding hands, still staring right at the house. I watched them for a few more seconds, and then one of them raised their hand and waved at me. Not in the general direction of the house, right at me. I ducked back and started freaking out and cursing. I hadn't turned on any lights. There was no way they could have seen half of my face peeking out at them from the distance in the dark. I had no idea what to do and I didn't know if all the doors were locked, if the garage door was shut, or even when my family would be back home. I felt completely helpless, knowing that I didn't have the strength or ability to check every room in the house to make sure it was locked up tight. I went to the phone on my desk and frantically called my mom's phone, but her cell was off. She was likely in the movie. Same thing with my dad. I thought about calling the cops, but I didn't know exactly what to tell them. Sure, there was two people trespassing on my property, but they hadn't threatened me or attempted to break in yet. I didn't know how to put into words the sense of urgency and danger I felt. I crawled back to my wheelchair and rolled myself through the darkness and into the hallway that separated the living room and kitchen. That's when I heard a knock at the door. And I heard a muffled voice ask, Can we come in? I turned away from the front door and made my way towards the stairs, intending to climb them on my hands and knees, crawl to my room, and lock myself in there. My front door had a strip of narrow windows turning vertically down along the doorframe, and when I was nearly at the stairs, a masked face appeared through one of the windows, and shortly after I heard giggling. <laughs> Upon making eye contact with the mask, the person crooked their head to the side, I froze like a deer in the headlights. All I could do was stare back. I remember it so perfectly. As I'm typing this, my hands are shaking. The mask disappeared from view. And that's when I noticed the deadbolt to the front door was unlocked. All anyone had to do was turn the knob and they could walk right in. Then there was a knock on the back door. And another small muffled voice. I could barely hear what it said because of the sound of my heart pounding in my ears. I shut my eyes and buried my face into my hands. I heard rattling coming from the back door. I'm not very religious, but in that moment, I prayed to whoever would listen. I'm not sure how long I sat there, crying, and waiting for one of the doors to open. But after what felt like 10 minutes, I looked up. There was no one peeking through the window at me. I slid out of my chair, crawled slowly to the stairs and into my room, where I shut the door and locked it. I'm not positive about this last part, but right before I shut the door, I glanced down in the dark hallway, and I thought I saw the shadowy outline of a dark figure, slowly tiptoeing up the stairs. I locked the door and proceeded to suffer through the longest night of my life. I never heard anything else from either inside the house or outside. My parents and sister arrived after 1 a.m., and by that time, my shirt was soaked through with sweat. They thought by the look on my face, I had suffered a stroke or something, and nearly called the ambulance for me. I never saw these masked people again. Of course, my parents didn't believe me. Why would they? There was no evidence that someone had broken in. It was just much easier for them to conclude that I just had a nightmare. My legs have since healed, and even though I still walk with a slight limp, there was otherwise no permanent damage. If I had to choose though, I would rather break both of my legs again, just to avoid the feeling of helplessness and terror that I felt that night when I looked into the hollow black eyes of that porcelain mask. This happened in October of 2014. I am originally from a small town, but I moved to a larger area in the Midwest for grad school when this happened. I rented a room and shared a house with other students near the university. 
It's an older two-story house with a one-story extension in the back, which serves as our living room. When you walk through the front door, there's a staircase immediately to the left, which goes up and to a hallway that turns right. In the hall, there's a bathroom to the left, and my room is at the end of the hall to the left, and there's two other rooms on the right side. At the time, I had three roommates, a girl that lived across the hall, and a guy that lived in the other room upstairs, and there was another guy in the downstairs bedroom. All of them were usually gone on the weekends. On the night in question, I was dating my girlfriend for a little over a month. It was a Saturday night and I picked her up in my car. We went out, had a few drinks, and we took an Uber home because I didn't feel comfortable driving. We got to the house and went immediately upstairs to my room. We were the only ones in the house. After me and my girlfriend had some intimate time together, we fell asleep. I'm a pretty heavy sleeper, but my girlfriend is not and she nudged me awake to tell me that she heard a noise coming from the outside. I told her that it was probably some drunk people walking by, since we live close to campus, or maybe it was a raccoon or some other small animal. She seemed satisfied with that and tried to go back to sleep. Just then, we heard another noise, coming from the back of the house, and it didn't sound like people just walking by. I got out of bed and walked to one of my windows, which faced the back of the house, directly on top of the extension. I had the curtains and blinds down, but I peeked from around the corner and looked outside. My slight buzz and drowsiness went away immediately, and my heart was racing like crazy. After I looked outside and saw the silhouette of a person climb onto the roof of the extension, my girlfriend saw my reaction and asked what was wrong. I immediately told her to grab a phone and go to Jessica's room across the hall, lock the door and call 911 because there was an intruder on the roof of my house. My girlfriend did as she was told. Well, I slipped on a pair of gym shorts and shoes. I grabbed a kitchen knife that was on my desk after eating some dinner the night before, and I stood next to the window with my back against the wall and listened closely. I could hear the person walk along the roof, barely feeling his footsteps. Then I heard a noise and could tell that he was fidgeting with the bathroom window, which was right next to my room. Luckily, the window was locked. I tiptoed outside my room to the hall, waiting to attack if he broke the window, knowing that I had to protect my home and my girlfriend. I stopped hearing the noise coming from the bathroom window, and then started hearing a similar noise coming from my window, the one I was just standing next to. My heart was pounding. I gripped the knife tightly in my hand, mentally rehearsing on what I would do if he managed to break in. All of this occurred in just a few seconds, but I realized that maybe I could scare the intruder away and avoid confrontation completely. I took a deep breath and yelled, I have a gun, come inside and I will fucking shoot you. And I heard the thud of footsteps going away from the window and then the noise of gravel. I was sweating at this point. I walked outside my room and knocked on Jessica's door, telling my girlfriend it was me and the intruder was gone. She unlocked the door and opened it and I saw that she had been crying. I dropped the knife and hugged her and told her everything was going to be okay. Just then, I saw blue and red lights outside the window of Jessica's room, which faced the front of the house. I told my girlfriend to come with me so we could tell the police what happened. I walked downstairs, turned on the porch light, and unlocked the door, opening it slowly with my hands held up. The police were approaching with their guns drawn and saw me in nothing but shorts and shoes, drenched in sweat. I kept my hands high and told them that I lived here and that the intruder ran away out back. The police then said something into his radio, some code, and saying that there was a possible intruder on the loose, and he stood there with us while the other officer walked inside the house. I was told that he was going to check and make sure that there was no one inside the house. After what seemed like hours, but really was only a few minutes, I heard a voice over the radio. All clear. We went inside and one officer began to ask us questions while the other looked around outside. After giving him our statements, the other officer walked back in and told us that it looked like the intruder had climbed on top of our garbage cans and then climbed onto our roof because one of our cans was tipped over. Since the house was dark and there was no light outside and no cars in the lot, we have been victims of an attempted robbery. I asked the officer if there was any weapons that they might have left behind and he said no. It was unlikely the intruder had wanted to harm anyone, as there had been a series of break-ins during the last several weeks around campus, 
with intruders mainly taking prescription drugs. He advised me to get a better weapon than a steak knife, and to keep the lights on inside, and our windows locked, and to consider installing outside lights. I asked if he would fingerprint the window, but he said he couldn't, because nothing had been taken and no one was harmed, and most likely this person was wearing gloves. The police also told us that there were units searching the neighborhood, but it was unlikely they would find anyone, since I couldn't give a description of the person, seeing only a silhouette. Needless to say, my girlfriend and I didn't get much sleep that night. The next day, I called my landlord and told him what happened. The following day, we had a bright light installed in our back patio that turned on when it got dark automatically, and a motion sensor outside the window upstairs that shines brightly if anyone stands on the roof. Not content on just threatening a burglar with a gun, I went out and bought one, and I now keep it in my nightstand drawer beside my bed. I used to live in a two-story house in Boise, Idaho. Both floors were meant to serve as a single bedroom apartment. I lived on the second floor, and the floor beneath me was vacant. I entered and exited the apartment through the back deck, and would walk down a wooden stairs to the driveway. There was a door in my living room that led downstairs to the second apartment, but it was deadbolted from my side. In turn, there was a door at the bottom of the stairs that was deadbolted from the other side. The entire time I lived in the second floor apartment, I never had anyone living underneath me. I would occasionally ask the landlord why that was, and he would always shrug and say that the building had a bad reputation. It had caught fire in the late 80s and two people had died downstairs. One extremely stormy evening, I was watching football in my living room when the power went out. I sighed and gathered some candles and a flashlight and decided that I might as well turn in early even though it was only about 9 o'clock. I climbed into bed, but since I wasn't very tired, I spent a good hour tossing and turning. When 10 o'clock finally came around, I was about ready to get out of bed and just start making shadow puppets with my flashlight, just to pass the time, when I heard a door slam from somewhere in the house. I shot up in bed. I knew for a fact that I was alone in my apartment, and no one was supposed to be downstairs. The next second I heard heavy feet charging up the stairs from the downstairs apartment and someone had began putting their weight into the door that led into my living room. I leapt out of bed and grabbed my cell phone to call the cops. I locked myself in my bedroom and frantically told the operator that there was someone in the house trying to get into my apartment. There came a tremendous banging on the other side of the door like someone was wielding a sledgehammer or an axe trying to break it down. The operator confirmed that she could hear what was going on, and that the police were on their way. I stayed on the line for what felt like another hour, hysterically telling the operator who my parents were, and to tell them I loved them in case I died. In retrospect, I probably should have just grabbed my keys and simply leapt out of my bedroom window and into the driveway and floored it out of there in my car. But I wasn't exactly thinking straight. I was convinced that I was about to die. When the police arrived, their wailing alarms drowned out the noise of the thunder and rain. They breached the house from the ground floor, and I heard them beneath me screaming, Police! And the noise on the staircase abruptly stopped. I heard more of the policemen on the back deck, knocking on the glass of the sliding door, and I ran out of my bedroom to let them in. Before I could even ask if they caught the intruder, they quickly rushed me out of the house and into the rain, claiming that the house was on fire. I waited in a patrol car in my pajamas, pretty damn wet and upset as the policemen ran in and out of the building with flashlights. After the fire truck had arrived, a police officer got into the car with me and offered me a towel and then started to ask me questions about the intruder. I told him all that I knew, which wasn't much. The officer then explained that upon entering the house, the bottom door of the stairs was deadbolted shut, as was my door at the top of the stairs, and there was absolutely no damage to either door. Upon entering the house, the officers were overwhelmed by the smell of smoke and immediately called the fire department, assuming there were flames raging inside the walls. Despite the smell, the firemen concluded that there was no fire anywhere, and besides myself, there was absolutely no evidence that anyone had been in the house. The landlord arrived shortly after, as I sat in my living room in the dark, drinking whiskey right out of the bottle, muttering about how I wasn't crazy. I definitely heard the sound of someone attacking the door. He told me that the previous tenants who lived downstairs had been a single father and his disabled son. 
One night, the son had accidentally set a fire to the carpet in the living room, and the father and son were both trapped in the stairway, unable to open the door to the second floor, and had died of smoke inhalation. I moved out the following month. For reference, I'm a 20-year-old male who weighs about 200 pounds. I live in a suburban area of a very large city which I won't disclose because if I did, it would make it extremely easy to figure out where I live. This experience happened to me about two weeks ago, and I'm still shaken up from it. I worked as a busboy on the weekends at a popular catering hall near where I lived. I had been working there for a little over a month at that point, and it was actually my last day working there since I had another job that was offering me more hours with better pay if I was available to work on weekends. I had to work a party that lasted from 7pm up until midnight, and I had to stay for almost two hours after the party was over to reset the room for the following morning. At around 2 o'clock in the morning, we finished resetting the room, and we were told we could leave. I was about to walk out of the building when my boss ran over to me and asked if I could help her move a table to the upstairs room, which I did. We placed the table where it needed to go, and then we both went back downstairs to leave. We walked outside and said goodnight to each other, as she got into the Uber car that she had requested to take her home. Now due to numerous setbacks in my life, I unfortunately do not have my driver's license yet. The catering hall is only about a 30-40 to 40 minute walk away from my house, and I don't mind walking. But during my time working there, my parents were nice enough to drive me to and from work. My mom told me to call her when I got off work, and she would give me a lift home, as she didn't want me walking by myself that late at night. I gave her a call on her phone. It immediately went to voicemail indicating that it was off. I tried again and the same thing happened. I thought to myself that she must have fallen asleep on the couch and forgot to put her phone on the charger, so it must have died. I called my dad hoping his phone wasn't on silent, as it usually was when he goes to sleep. As luck would have it, it must have been since I called his phone a few times and got no answer. Shit, I thought to myself. All my coworkers had left and I couldn't ask anyone I worked with for a ride home. And the only bus nearby that would cut my trip in half stops running at about midnight, so I couldn't take the bus home. I also didn't call an Uber since I forgot my debit card and only had two singles on me. Looks like I had to say fuck it and walk home instead. To give you some perspective, the catering hall was located in between a service road that runs along a major highway and a street that rides along the coast side. In order to get home, I had to walk down the service road for about 10 minutes until it hit the aforementioned coast side road, which went underneath the highway and out the other side. And then I would have to walk two more blocks up the road until it hits another street that I had to turn right on, and walk for about another 10 minutes, half of which is spent walking uphill, until I reached the street that entered the community I lived in. I began walking, and about five minutes later I passed a bar where I see a car idling in the parking lot, with only the left headlight shining. The car was a white Toyota Camry if I'm not mistaken, and there were two guys on the car smoking a cigarette. I quickly glanced over while passing by, and I didn't think much of what I saw. The bar closed at 1 in the morning, but I figured these guys just pulled into the parking lot for a quick smoke. I turned onto the road that runs underneath the highway, and was crossing the service road on the other side. When I get the sudden urge to look behind me, I quickly looked back to see the same car driving down the road I was walking along. It wasn't exactly pitch black, but it was still relatively dark enough where I might not have recognized the car if both headlights had been shining. I continued walking and eventually turned right onto the road with the hill I mentioned earlier. When they slowed down next to me and the passenger rolled down the window to talk to me, the road that I had turned onto was darker than the road I was walking on before so I wasn't able to make out exactly what either of them looked like, but from what I could make out, they both were probably in their late 20s, wearing dark clothing. The driver was a white male and the passenger was a black guy. The passenger then rolls down the window and asks what I'm doing walking so late at night, to which I respond that I'm walking home from work. He then asked me, Would you like us to give you a ride home? I responded by saying, That's very kind of you, but I'm fine walking by myself. Thank you for the offer though. He gets visibly annoyed. In a somewhat agitated tone, he says, Nah man, it's dark and dangerous outside. You should let us give you a ride home. We'll get you there safe and sound. 
Come on, you can trust us. At this point, the only things on the road were the car and myself. I decline once again and dart behind the car and walk across the street. I walk up and turn left into a parking lot of a different community that was about two blocks away from my own that had a chain in front of it, preventing people without a proper key from parking inside the lot. All of a sudden, the driver rolls down the window and screams, Get the fuck back here, you little bitch! He does a U-turn and pulls up to the entrance of the parking lot, and the passenger jumps out and begins chasing me. The driver peels off, presumably to get on the road on the other side to ambush me. My adrenaline immediately hits me and I begin sprinting away from this crazy man. He then yells, We're gonna give you a ride. Stop running away from us. I looked back and we had a bit of distance between us. He looked somewhat chubby and probably wasn't expecting me to be able to run so fast, since I'm slightly overweight myself. I turn onto the road and continue sprinting, until I hear a car squeal down the road behind me. I look back to see a single headlight in the distance speeding down the road, and the man chasing after me starting to gain on me. I start freaking out and run and turn left, and begin making a break for the park since the area of the park I was running towards was dark and thick with trees, so I figured that I could lose them in there. As I run into the park, struggling to continue sprinting as I was losing my breath, I look back to see the car turn onto the road. The driver then stops the car and yells at his friend. Hey, get back in the car. The cops hang out back there and they might see us. Leave him. We're getting out of here. The man chasing me stops, turns back towards the car, and flings the door open and jumps in. As soon as he slams the door shut, the driver does a U-turn and speeds off, turns right onto the road up ahead, and then disappears. The park is extremely large and I remember my parents talking about a good number of drug deals taking place there, and that the police were starting to send officers to patrol the area at night to bust up any drug deals they witness, and that must have been what spooked my pursuers. I jogged quickly into the park and hid in the darkness beneath the trees for about 20 minutes, just to be sure that they were definitely gone, and I tried to calm myself down as much as I could. Afterwards, I walked through the park towards the exit into my community. My senses were on hyper alert, for all I knew there could have been another weirdo lurking around in the dark. I made it to my house and quickly unlocked the door. My dog started growling but stopped once he saw me walking into the living room. I looked to my right to see my mom passed out on the couch with the TV still on, just as I thought. I walked into my room and flopped onto my bed exhausted both physically and emotionally. I was so relieved that I had gotten away from those two guys, and was never happier to be in the safety of my own home. I always knew it was dangerous to walk alone at night, and I usually don't. But I had hoped when I did, I would be okay. I was proven wrong that night. I woke up around noon, and walked into the living room to say hello to my parents, and my mom gets up and hugs me and apologizes profusely for falling asleep when she was supposed to pick me up. She said that she had woken up around 5 in the morning and freaked out that she had fallen asleep and that something bad might have happened to me. She rushed into my room to see me sound asleep and was relieved that I had gotten home safely. I didn't say anything about what happened on my walk home that night, as I knew it would devastate them to hear that they almost lost their son, and my mom would have never been able to live with the guilt, as she could have prevented the whole encounter if she had stayed awake to come pick me up. Up until this point, I never actually told anyone except for a very close friend of mine about this experience. I have no idea what those two guys' intentions were, but I knew for a fact that they were not good, and I don't think I ever want to find out what they were up to. I'm just glad I'm safe. And after sharing this experience with you guys, I hope I can move on from it and leave it in the past. When I was young, up until I was about 10, I lived on a 7 acre ranch. There was a small house in front of the property where we stayed, a huge grass yard and a cabinet shop behind it, and an orchard in the very back full of walnut trees. My father was a carpenter and always worked in the shop, and my mother was a school teacher that was almost always busy. Because of their jobs and the fact that they were kind of new to parenting, as I got older, they really didn't pay as much attention to where I would wander off to. I would spend my days roaming around the yard, playing in the dirt, and running through the walnut trees. I obviously did not question my lack of supervision, as it was fun to explore this huge plot of land and I thought I was just being a normal kid. 
When I was about seven, my father surprised me with a brand new child-sized ATV. It wasn't one of those electric ones that you're probably picturing either. It was a damn fast gas-powered four-wheeler. Now at this point, a good amount of you are probably questioning why someone would give a gas-powered ATV to their seven-year-old child. But like I said, my parents were a bit reckless. And they, well my dad, just wanted me to have fun. Pretty much right after I got the thing, I learned how to drive it by myself. And I started going further into and past the property than I ever had before. Now I had a free ride to basically as far as my young self will let me go before turning back. I started riding through the orchards behind my house almost every day. And I loved it more than I ever loved anything before. I would leave my house and be gone for hours. After a while, I gradually started roaming farther and farther away from my house as I became more brazen as I got older. I would ride down this dirt path that led past what I assumed was our neighbor's land into a ditch that held water. At the time, I just liked looking at the water as it flowed, and I felt like I was an explorer. I honestly never contemplated on what I was doing could be the least bit dangerous, and I really don't think my parents knew how far I was riding. When I think back on it now, just the idea of riding a pretty dangerous piece of equipment far away from my house without my parents knowing where I was, and before cell phones existed is pretty scary in itself, as I could have crashed or hit my head, and no one would have been able to find me. However, luckily this never happened, and it's not what this story is about. So one day, like any other day, I was running far away from home, and I passed by a man wearing a dirty white shirt, denim jeans, and a wicker farmer's hat, I remember this vividly as this was the first person I had ever seen in the whole time I had been out here. I remember the surprised look in his eyes as he stared at me while I rode past him. I had no reason to stop and my parents always taught me about stranger danger. So I kept going and forgot all about it. On my way back home, a couple of hours later I was coming up to the same spot and it dawned on me that this is where I had seen the man. I looked ahead not expecting him to be there. As I said, hours had passed, yet as the trees parted, there he was. I really didn't think it was too weird because I figured that he was either a farmer or a homebody. So I kept driving closer to where he was. He seemed friendly to be honest. He had a big smile on his face like he was happy to see me. To my 10 year old self, I thought he was just a friendly guy. So I waved at him as I passed by, and he waved back. I continued on my way and drove home not thinking much about it. I don't really remember how much time had passed between then and the next time I went riding, but it could not have been more than a couple of days. Like usual, I took the same dirt road, past the same few orchards to the same ditch full of water. I didn't think much about my previous encounter, so I hadn't been thinking about the stranger with the big smile. I was sitting on the edge of the ditch when I heard footsteps in the dirt coming up from behind me. Again, I remember vividly because it was not a common occurrence to see anybody else on this trail. I remember being more curious than scared, and I turned around to see the same stranger with a smile. This time, his smile seemed more like a toothy grin. He called out to me as he walked up, asking me what my name was in a heavy southern drawl. I told him with confidence that I wasn't really allowed to talk to strangers, to which he said, Well, that's a good idea. Although you really shouldn't be out here all by yourself, it can be dangerous for a kid your age. I remember this striking me in the gut with a little bit of a butterfly feeling. I wasn't afraid, but I felt uneasy. This piqued my curiosity, however, as I wondered what he meant, so I asked him. He continued to walk closer to me as he answered. I heard they found a little boy out here, just around your age. I think it was in that ditch right there where he drowned. I would like to point out that although my parents were reckless, they were not stupid. If there had been a drowning near our house, or had been a story in the paper, they definitely would not have let me out anymore. Anyways, he continued. Why don't you come with me and I'll take you back to your parents. It ain't safe around here for a kid your age. Uh, it's okay. I have my quad right there. I'll just ride back. I pointed over to the side of him where my quad was, but he didn't look. His eyes remained fixed on me. They were deep and dark, almost black, 
and piercing into me. At this point, I was scared, and I knew that I was in a bad situation. I was hoping that he was just a concerned old man, but there was no way I was going to go anywhere with him. I got to my feet and started to walk to my quad, to which the man said, Should a kid your age be riding something that dangerous? Let's just put it in my truck and I'll give you a ride back. I don't see a truck. I said looking around, hoping that I could talk my way out of the situation. Oh, it's right over there on my property. You can't see it from here, he said, his smile widening. It's really okay, I'll just go now, I said starting again to walk to my quad. But as I passed him, he reached and grabbed my arm. You really shouldn't be out here, he said staring me deep in the eyes. It's not safe for little kids. Let me go, you're hurting me, I shouted starting to panic. But this only made him grip tighter. Maybe you don't deserve to go back home. What kind of parents would let their kid out here all alone? Maybe you should come back with me and I'll take care of you. At this point, I was about to pee my pants. I was freaking out and I started to scream. I can't remember if I was saying anything. I just know I was screaming as loud as I ever had before. This only seemed to anger him. His once toothy grin turned into a face of anger. He put his hand over my face, and I took this opportunity to bite his finger as hard as I could. I still remember the taste of blood in my mouth. I know I must have hurt him pretty bad. Thankfully, this caught him off guard as he finally let me go. I knew this was my one and only chance to get away from this weirdo, so I booked it to my quad as he winced in pain. You little shit, get the fuck over here! He shouted in anger. I knew I didn't have much time, so I jumped on my quad and turned the key as fast as I could. As soon as I pressed down on the gas pedal, I felt a hand start to grab my neck. Luckily, he didn't have a grip yet, as I was already starting to drive away. I punched it and got the hell out of there. At this point, all I could hear was the sound of my quad, so I wasn't sure if he was running after me. But I wasn't going to risk looking back. I drove down the dirt path as fast as my quad would go. It was probably the fastest I had ever driven it. When I got home, I peeled out into the dirt road and ran into the house, hoping to God my mom was home. I burst into a room bawling, and there she was. She asked me what was wrong, but I couldn't talk as I was so afraid. I cried for a good 30 minutes before I summed up the strength and told her what had happened. I remember the fear in her eyes as I described what happened. She pulled me close and hugged me as hard as she ever had. The next day, I talked to a police officer and recounted the story of what transpired. I honestly don't remember much after this, as I think I started to block it out. It's not really something a 10-year-old wants to think about. Needless to say, they never let me off the property again. My dad started drinking and we lost the house soon after this anyways, so I didn't have to live there much longer. Recently, I was thinking about that day, after I started trying to remember various parts of my childhood. My parents never told me what happened after the cops were called, and I never really asked because I tried not to think about it. So yesterday, I went over to my mom's house and asked her if they ever found the guy, considering that he had to have lived pretty close to our property. She was kind of startled by the question because we hadn't talked about this in over 15 years. She paused for a minute as if pondering rather to tell me, and said, We didn't have any neighbors out that way. It was all corporate-owned property, and the description you gave didn't really match any of the neighbors that lived in the other direction. We called the cops, and they went to search where you told us you were, but the guy was long gone by the time they got there. They looked around the property and found an abandoned house that hadn't been used in years since the land was purchased. When they looked inside, they could tell that he had been staying there. Apparently, he left his stuff behind. We never told you this because you were too young, but one of the things they found was a black grocery bag. It had a roll of duct tape and a hunting knife inside. Thanks, Mom. But did I really need to know that? This incident happened in 2011, shortly after I returned home from college. My family home was a relatively safe area, 
but around the time I left for school, it had started to decline somewhat. I didn't quite notice right away, and upon my return I was going through a very depressing time in my life. At the time I was staying up all night playing the newly released Elder Scrolls V, and on that particular occasion I had gone all day without eating or getting out of bed except for bathroom breaks. So I decided to go to a very popular 24-hour restaurant located very near my house. It's directly in front of a train stop in my city. There are frequently homeless and transient types around that area, but I never had an issue as the restaurant is typically packed with post-clubbing clientele at these hours. I park directly in front of the restaurant and go in to order. My food was ready very quickly and I got back into my car. The car next to me pulled out first. I hadn't noticed the driver get in, but I didn't give it much thought. The car then pauses in the middle of the small parking lot. I took this as the driver being courteous and allowing me to leave, so I pulled out and went on my way. As I drove home, the car that had let me out was apparently driving in the same direction I was. Just to be cautious, I didn't go home right away. I kept driving past my residential area, going nonsensical ways, in circles basically. The car continued to follow me. I continued driving until I saw an approaching yellow light. I decided to run the light when it was red. The driver behind me did so as well. It was at that point that I started to get scared. I left my cell phone at home because I was only going to be gone for 10 minutes max. I know, dumbass decision. It was then I made the impulsive decision to go into my residential area. The streets there are like a weird maze. Unless you know it well, it's very easy to get turned around. I turned into an adjacent condo complex that had another entrance directly in my area, but those roads were windy and confusing. I was able to get some distance between me and my pursuer, but not much. As we exited the condos, he was able to see me make a quick right uphill. I drove quickly at this point, using my knowledge of the area to my advantage to lose them. We did this dance for a good 20 minutes before I was able to round the corner near the particular cul-de-sac where I lived, without him in sight. My house is adjacent to the corner home. I turned very quickly into my driveway and shut off the car. I locked it so that all the lights would turn off. I sank into the seat as much as I could, trying to avoid being visible. After a minute or so, I heard the car drive down the cul-de-sac. I heard it turn around at the end of the street and drive back the opposite way. I don't know for sure if it was my follower. I ran into my house after that. It was this event that made me realize that I really need to take care of my own safety, and you never know what dangers may follow you home. What would you do if you were alone in a dark place? Not even a strange place, some place familiar to you, like your own basement or garage, and you happen to see two points of light glinting at you from across the room. Would your fight or flight instinct immediately kick in, or would you freeze, unable to move, because of the shock and terror weighing you down? Back in 2010, I had this experience firsthand, though unfortunately not in a place that was familiar to me. At the time, I didn't know if I would ever see daylight again. I live in Auckland, New Zealand, which is located on the Northern Island. I have a degenerative bone disease that weakens me. It makes me even more frail with every passing year. At the time, I had just been diagnosed and decided to try to live my life to the fullest. I had a friend named Jacoby who was a big time conspiracy nut. He didn't have a cell phone or a bank account and made some money here and there by showcasing his sidewalk chalk art. I asked him what he would do if his days were numbered. He said that he would find a spot untouched by man and mark his name on a rock. I decided to take his advice and do some cave exploration in the Northland, but I didn't want to visit just any tourist trap cave. I wanted to visit a cave that most people didn't know about. Jacoby and I did some research and made contact with a few hardcore outdoor type guys and discovered that there was a small cave that very few people knew about because it was incredibly difficult to get to. We met up with a couple of guys named Ben and Angus who knew where the cave was, and we put together a group of six people to go exploring. I knew the idea of a guy with brittle bones going exploring in caves doesn't sound like a brilliant idea. I had at least four people pointing that out to me, but I badly wanted to experience it as soon as possible. 
before I grew too weak to climb a staircase. Ben warned us that where we were going, there was a very small chance of a rescue in case of an emergency, and that we would be all on our own. I said my goodbyes to my immediate family, and started the trip at dawn. By 10am, we reached the spot where we would have to leave our car, and by midday, we were deep in the heart of the New Zealand wilderness. Angus forged the path ahead with a machete. I followed immediately after with Jacoby and my other friend Elijah, carrying the tents, water, and first aid, while Ben and another guy named Mark followed behind. All things considered, I was feeling very well despite my condition and was able to keep pace with the others as the day wore on. Every once in a while, we would pass a tree with a weird symbol carved into it, and Jacoby would go on about how some alien race had probably landed there back in World War II after the Nazis failed to colonize Antarctica. I just rolled my eyes. That was the kind of conspiracy theory noise he was always going on about. We let him keep talking because he provided us with some unintended laughs. By nightfall, we were nearly at the cave, so we set up camp and built a fire. And then Ben used a flashlight to lead us to the cave's entrance. We cracked some celebratory beers as we shone the lights deep into the depths of the cave, the floor slanting downwards at a nearly 60 degree angle. We had just finished our beers and cigars and were all about to head back to camp for the night when we all heard something echo deep down within the cave. It sounded like a rock had shifted and rolled a bit. Nothing too exciting, but the faint noise was enough to get Jacoby going. He went on about how the Draconians were nearby and they were hidden in their invisible cloaking devices, like Predator, and we were all in their crosshairs. Ben then screamed into the night that Jacoby was our leader, and his head was the one they wanted, which got us all laughing. We headed back to camp, but as I turned to follow the others up the path, I glanced down into the darkness of the cave, and for a split second, I thought I saw a pair of eyes glinting up at me, reflecting off the night sky before disappearing. A chill passed over me, but I immediately shook it off, convinced that I was just seeing things, and I didn't even tell the others. The following morning we anchored two lines at the mouth of the cave, and steadily made our way down, holding onto the ropes for support. Once at the bottom, there was a small cavern, with two massive rocks that were pinned against each other, that we had to crawl under in order to continue deep into the cave. We each had two flashlights, water, and were each tied to another person, so no one could get lost. Mark and I were attached to each other's belts by a cord, and together we made our way in front of the others and deeper into the dark, rocky void. I'm not sure how many of you have been deep underground, but it's a thrilling yet terrifying experience. You can almost feel the weight of the earth crushing down upon you from above. The air is extremely stale and dusty and absolutely everything echoes. We got used to keeping our voices low as we spoke. All in all, we were underground for a good several hours, pausing every so often to take a breather, but for the most part continuing to push onward down the twisting, winding cavern. We reached a section of the cave where it was too narrow to go any further, as the crack in the wall was barely big enough to fit me moving sideways. I took out a spray can and marked my initials on a rock, and then began the rough uphill climb with Mark back to the others. We had been out front the entire time, and we were heading back from what we had assumed to be a dead end. So imagine my shock when from the darkness behind us came the faintest sound of what sounded like short, sharp intakes of breath. Mark and I both heard it and turned back around, shutting our lights back down the way we had come from. But we didn't see anything. Mark made a comment that it had to be the sound of air moving through a crack in the wall, and we kept moving. After two minutes or so, I paused. Positive, I heard the sound again, which didn't make sense, because if it was really just air coming through a crack, we would have been out of earshot by now. I glanced behind me again and nearly gasped out loud. This is going to sound incredibly cliche, but I saw them again. Two pale eyes barely discernible staring back at me from the shadows. In that moment, I thought of screaming and telling Mark to run, but I forced myself to keep a straight face as I turned back around and continued climbing. I thought about dogs being able to tell when humans are afraid and attacking if they ran, 
In my mind, whatever was behind me was keeping its distance for now, hesitant to get too close. But if we started to run, the thing might have felt emboldened and started to chase us. For the next half an hour, Mark and I made our way back through the cave, me glancing over my shoulder every five minutes, but I didn't see the eyes again. When we met up with Ben and Elijah, I didn't say anything about the eyes. I was terrified that if I said anything, they might have wanted to retrace our steps and get a closer look. We made our way back to the mouth of the cave, much more slowly than I would have liked. And after another hour or so of carefully watching our footing, we emerged from the cave's mouth and back out into the daylight, which nearly blinded me. It took another 40 minutes before Angus and Jacoby clambered out, and in that time, I was having a nervous breakdown, convinced that the unseen thing had grabbed them in the dark. Turns out Angus had taken a fall and scraped up his leg, and they had to move slowly. Even after we returned to camp, started a fire and cooked dinner, I kept my mouth shut. Everyone was in a good mood and having fun. I didn't want to cause concern or suspicion bringing up the eyes. Now that I was back out in daylight, I was starting to convince myself that I had never seen them at all. That night I had trouble sleeping. I tossed and turned in my tent for so long that I actually caused the tent to detach from its lining and collapse in on itself. I cursed and struggled in the dark to find the zipper and free myself. When I finally poked my head out of the tangle of cloth, I froze. Right at the edge of the campsite, staring directly at me, were the eyes, closer than they had ever been. I felt around in the dark until I found the flashlight, and without breaking eye contact, I turned it on, keeping my hand pressed over the light. The eyes were still there, unmoving, unblinking, and in that moment, I had my chance to shine the light directly on the thing, but I didn't. I couldn't. After maybe a minute, the eyes disappeared, and I heard a rustling in the undergrowth. I stayed dead still for what seemed like a small eternity, and eventually passed out from exhaustion. The next morning, Jacoby woke me, and pointed out fresh marks on a tree, right at the edge of the campsite where I had seen the eyes. Three vertical cuts with a fourth horizontal one underneath. Jacoby was convinced the draconian race had visited us, but when I made eye contact with Ben, he looked disturbed, and from the look in his eyes, I got the sense that he was familiar with whatever I had seen the night before. Perhaps he had seen it too. We packed up and left, and we all made it back safely. I can't really describe why I didn't point the light at the eyes. I guess a part of me was terrified of what I would see. I suppose it could have been nothing, or something that was laughably obvious and unthreatening. But I don't think so. I believe that it was more than nothing. I believe it was something. Something I couldn't describe even if I had seen it in the light. I haven't been exploring since. I still live in New Zealand, but my condition has gotten worse, and I am now bound to a wheelchair. Regardless of that scare, I'm glad I took the trip. I still talk to Jacoby every now and then, and even though I would never admit it, maybe some of those far-out conspiracy theories aren't as crazy as I once thought. There's always a reason to be afraid.